para triathlete for Great Britain. As a world champion and Paralympic triathlete, I wanted to tell the world some of the stories behind the people and the personalities I have met throughout my nine years in the sport. With the Paralympic Games around the corner, now seems the perfect time to get to know some of the para triathletes who will be going for gold in Tokyo. Today, I'll be going beyond with Canada's Jessica Tuomila. Canada's Jess Tuomila made a splash on her arrival into para triathlon back in 2016 with a silver medal at the national championships in the visually impaired category. Her first WPS and World Cup wins came in 2018 following a duathlon world title in 2017. After victory in Tokyo at the Paralympic Test Event World Cup and the World Championship Bronze, Jess is now looking for a big return to Japan for the main event in August. You lost your eyesight age three to retinal cancer and obviously yeah. exceptionally young. Um, how was life as a youngster and then getting into sport from that? Um, so I think when I was a kid, I don't really think I knew any difference. So um, when you're younger, it, it was kind of when, okay, let me try again. <laughs> um, so as you said, I lost my sight when I was about three, three and a half. Um, and I grew up in a really small kind of isolated community and there weren't a lot of resources available to my parents. And so I think they just sort of had this expectation that we just had to figure it out. And, um, and I had a lot of cousins. I don't have any siblings, but I had a lot of cousins. And in order to play with my cousins and interact with them, I just had to do things the way they were doing them. Um, and there was some adaptation. And at the time, obviously, we didn't know that's what it was called. But it was, and most of the time, the adaptation was just, I was holding on to somebody <laughs> so I could go with them too. Yeah. Um, and about ages, you know, four to nine-ish, that's kind of cute and okay. And then when you hit about, you know, grade five or 10 years old, um, I think kids start developing their own individual identities and, uh, it's not as cute to be like hanging on to each other. So I think sort of grade four, grade five is when I started realizing I'm like, Oh, I, I am different. Um, and that's really when I was trying to get into sports. And when I was smaller, I, I could be involved in sports because again, not a lot of adaptation was required. Cause I mean, I don't know, you watch a little kids, you know, any yeah. kind of team match, they're all kind of racing around together in a clump. So, <laughs> you know, um, and the public school system was really uncomfortable with me uh, being involved in sports. And so they, they blocked me basically at, at every turn. And I mean, in gym class, their answer for me was, you can sit on the floor and roll this ball at the wall. And I'm like, why would I do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so kind of by the end of grade five and into grade six, I was really frustrated. I tried to even um, joined the baseball team and I was like, well, you know, this can't be that bad. Like it's baseball. And they wanted me to wear a helmet. And I'm like, but is everybody else wearing a helmet? And they're like, no. And I was like, well, then I'm not doing that. Cause you know, you're at the age where like, you want to be like everybody else. Um, and so by the end of grade six, I decided that I wanted to go. There's a school for the blind, um, in Canada. And I, told my parents, I'm like, this is where I'm going. <laughs> like, um, you're 11. <laughs> so, um, but I went and I, and that's where I learned how to swim. And I actually got involved in pretty much every sport that I possibly could. So much so in grade eight, they actually had to send me home for two weeks because I had burnt myself out by accident. <laughs> oh no, that's, that's amazing that um, you felt that you had, I guess, more opportunity and inclusion. And obviously, you know, they, the school managed to produce a, a world-class para-athlete out of you. Um, you were how old when you went to Sydney? Uh, just turned 17. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. young. And pretty you won a silver medal. That was pretty impressive. Yeah. At what point up until you were 17 did you, did you have the goal of, actually, do you know what? I, I really love what I do and I want to become a Paralympian. Was there a point in which you went, do you know what? I'm going to aim for this. Um. I don't, I don't think because I learned how to swim, like I was 12 when I actually learned how to swim. Um, I was terrified of water. I'd grown up like swimming in lakes and stuff, but I always 
either stayed where I could touch or I had floaty things. <laughs> um, and I failed swimming lessons like three times. And <laughs> so I think that swimming experience for me was really interesting because I had a lot of people telling me you're good at this and you should try to do this. And um, so it wasn't as much of an internal motivation as it is now. Um, it was, you know, I was young and I had people saying, well, you are good at this. And so um, it probably honestly wasn't until the year before the games where I was like, oh, maybe I can do this. Cause that, the Paralympic games were my first international competition. Wow. Um, so it's, it was kind of, I sort of skipped a whole bunch of steps. So I didn't actually believe that I belonged there. Um, and so, um, and I went on to Athens and I went on to Beijing and those, those games, I had some Beijing and I struggled. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it was, I felt a little more sense of belonging in those games just because I had internalized at that point, well, I, I, I can do this. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, I think my experience that way was a little bit different. Okay. Well, you know, it's, it's still pretty impressive. And was there anybody in that, um, I guess, time frame that inspired you to want to go to the Paralympics and then continue after your first games? Was there, was there any role models for you or was it simply just uh, family, friends, I think it was mostly family and friends. I had a coach. So I left um, the school for the blind at the end of grade nine. Um, and I went back into mainstream high school because I wanted to go to university and um, the school for the blind is tiny. And so I was, I was like, I'm going to have culture shock if I don't <laughs> get into a bigger um, yeah. mainstream system. So um, the coach that I had while I was in high school, he, he was just, and he still is. He's just one of those people that will do anything for his athletes, you know, bends over backwards. Uh, he knew how to push me. He knew how to, you know, get me to where I needed to be. And um, yeah, I, I just really respect him and, and really appreciate the time and effort that he put in. And after I went off to university, you know, we stayed in touch and I swam with him when I came home in the summers. And um, yeah, he was, he was a, dri a big driving force for me. Oh no, that's fantastic. I'm I'm very similar myself. My coach is he's coached me for for years, bless him. Um it's probably the right <laughs> word. Um but yeah. <laughs> have somebody that knows you and knows how you tick, it's a it's a really important thing, I believe, the coach athlete relationship. Um yeah. And then obviously you decided after two more games within swimming where you still placed very highly and at some world championships and the Pan American games, you medaled like fantastic. <laughs> what point did you think, oh, I don't want to do just one sport. I want to go and do okay. three. I found this on the web. Um, I, well, I, I actually retired after Beijing um, and was like, okay, I'm done. Like, I'm just done. I'm going to not do this athlete thing anymore. And I'm going to go out into the world and get a quote unquote real job. And um, <laughs> so I tried that. <laughs> And obviously it didn't work because I'm back. <laughs> um, but I mean, to be fair, in 2008, when I was training for Beijing, um, we had a 50 meter pool at the university and people were coming in and swimming. And I was like, what, like, what are you guys doing? And just through conversation, I found out about triathlon. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. I wonder, you know, if that's something I could do someday. Um, yeah, cool. and, and it kind of planted the seed. It never went away. And so probably 2014, 2015, I was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I should probably start trying. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, I don't know if you're the same, but my thing was like, I got to learn how to run. <laughs> so uh -huh. I bought a treadmill. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Painful on your shins and your calves. Uh-huh. <laughs> And how did you, obviously, you, you did your first WPS in Edmonton. Um, what was it like to, obviously, your first one to compete on a ho home games must have felt amazing. Um, how, how was that for you? Your first triathlon, what were the thoughts that went through your head? I, I can remember mine. and They weren't positive thoughts because it was very painful. I, I don't know how yours was. Uh, no, I'm similar to you. So my first triathlon was... Uh... March 2017, 
Yep. In Florida. Okay. Um, and it was hot. And at <laughs> that time, I apparently didn't know how to sweat. And <laughs> um, I was miserable. And um, I walked on the 5K. I couldn't even run the whole thing. And I just kept thinking, why am I doing this? I've already done this. I don't need to do this again. <laughs> and like, I was like, this can't be healthy. Like, like you said, it was all not good thoughts. And then I don't know why, but I just <laughs> kept going. Again and again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I definitely felt the same. And the one thing that I'm, I'm quite curious to, to know is obviously swimming is quite an individual sport. Uh, you, you really just... Um, you are in control of your race and I guess your own mental thoughts you've come into power triathlon and you now have a guide how how was that transition having to learn to work with somebody else harder than people think okay <laughs> um it was like you said swimming is very individual you're very much you are responsible for your own wins and losses and successes and failures yeah. um and coming into triathlon and having to work with a guide, it, it is a team sport for the visually impaired classification. Um, we have to work together. We probably should like each other because you're tied together a lot. <laughs> so, um, you know, and um, it's, it's not easy. It's learning how to communicate so that it works for both of you, um, knowing how to motivate both of you at the same time. Um, and just actually being willing to be that vulnerable in front of somebody else. Like you are so, I, and you know this, you're so far into the hurt locker that like when you're by yourself, it's, I don't know, for me, I felt safer going there um, when, I was, when I was swimming. Like, I mean, especially in swimming, your face is down in the water. Nobody really gets to see your pain face as much. Yeah. Um, but, you know, on, on the run, um, one thing that I, I struggled with and I still struggle with is sometimes I'm like, I'm not a good runner. Um, I'm, you know, this, this person, my guide, uh, is, is frustrated with me because I'm not running hard enough. And like, that's totally not what's going on in her head, but you know, that's, and then, you know, again, being willing to, to be that open and vulnerable to, to hurt that much in, in front of somebody else. Of course. I, I, can only imagine that the connection is probably one that becomes like a best friend because you are so trusting and open and vulnerable is there any part of it that I guess you have a wealth of experience as you know three times Paralympian <laughs> you're I guess as you're a team you become sort of like a a duo that's powerful because you both have strengths and weaknesses is that some do you have the same guide or do you have different guides and you have different strengths and weaknesses with different guides I Please tell me, I, I don't quite know. No, <laughs> um, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of very amazing and strong women. And um, uh, some of my training guides have been men, but when we race, we have to race with the same gender. Um, and so I say women because that's who I've raced with. Yeah. And um, I've learned so much from every single one of them. We all have different styles. Everyone, as you said, has strengths and weaknesses and um you know, I, I try to take something away from each person. If I, you know, if, if we switch guides, if we move on or, you know, sometimes other people's life goals change or, yeah. um, the one thing is, you know, making sure that the guide has to stay fitter and faster than the blind athlete. And so there's a lot that goes into it. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, really cool actually to, to see those strengths and weaknesses and, um, kind of harness those and put them together. And like you said, come up with this really powerful duel. So it's, it's kind of fun. Yeah. I, I can only imagine like what it feels like to cross the line and know that as, that as a pair, you've, you've managed to achieve like a, a medal or a podium. That must yeah, be yes. a happy experience yeah. to share with someone else. Yeah. For me, like uh, some, for me, that's probably the most powerful moment. Like ev every single time, when we cross the line, I have felt nothing but gratitude towards this person. Um, and like, and just like joy and just, I don't know, just this feeling of like, whoa, we just did that together. So uh -oh. yeah. did my video just go away? No, no, you're still here. Okay, good. All right. And window popped up. So I wasn't sure if it, um, oh, no, it's great. And I, I <laughs> 
I had a question uh, a while back, which was, do the guys receive medals as well as the, you know, the disabled? They do. So that, that's fairly new, I think. And I think it's something that actually athletics um, fought for um, because our guides train as hard as we do. They um, show up to practices, you know, they work with us, they work on their own and then they race with us. And so, in my opinion, they, they should get medals. Um, and like I said, it's a, we're, we're a team. It's not me with someone who happens to be propelling me along, like, you know, giving me directions. They don't propel, obviously. But, um, yeah. you know, and, and so, yeah, they do get medals. And that's really nice. Yeah, no, I really think nice. um, that's beautiful. Like you said, it's, it's about teamwork. And um, I'm sure that there's lots of people that would be quite interested um, how you adapt and change any of your training and racing to being completely blind. I mean, I know what it's like to go around a triathlon missing my lower right arm, but I couldn't imagine what it's like to go around. You have blackout goggles, I believe. And you mm -hmm. have, like, you're on the bike and I guess someone tells you if you need to push harder or changing gears, but how does it work for you? Could you talk us a bit about any adaptations that you might have? Yeah. So we have to wear blackout goggles. Um, okay. So the completely blind, uh, triathletes have to wear blackout goggles. And I think, as I understand it, it's to make sure that you actually are, in fact, completely blind <laughs> um, because we get a, um, a time advantage because we're racing other athletes who have um, some usable vision, um, which actually does um, – it's, it's just the nature of it. It just changes it, right? Um, so – they we wear the blackout goggles during the race to make sure that we all can't actually see <laughs> um and then in the water we wear um mine is just a piece of shot cord with two loops on the end and one end goes around my thigh and then the other end goes around my guide's thigh and to be honest i actually think the swim is the hardest because there's no talking at all um because if we're talking, we're not going fast enough. <laughs> so um, it's learning to like feel your guide's body without actually swimming on top of them. And yep. which becomes tricky if it's wavy or, you know, there's, there's, if there's turns, we've worked out, um, you know, a right turn hit me twice, a left turn hit me once, like that kind of stuff. So you kind of work that stuff out ahead of time. Um, and then on the bike, we're on a tandem bike, which is so much fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's really cool because, like, you, when you're in sync on a tandem, you just flow. Like, there's just such a, to me, a feeling of grace and power, and yeah. uh, it's a pretty cool feeling. Um, and then on the run, we carry – I use a hand tether. Some people choose to wear a tether around their waist because it gives them – um, a better arm swing, but because running is not my happy place, <laughs> um, holding onto the hand tether is, um, feels more secure to me. So it's basically just a piece of, um, climbing rope again with little tinier loops at the end and the loop goes over my thumb and then the other loop goes over my guide's thumb. And then we run basically arm to arm, like side by side, but we try not to touch each other because obviously that sort of slows down your momentum. Um, and then the biggest thing is guides are not to be towing the, the blind athletes at any point. So on the swim, um, we have to be within a certain distance of each other. And on the run, they can't be ahead of us. And when we cross the finish line, they can't be ahead of us either. Okay. And as you're like going around the run course and when you're on the bike, like, does your mm -hmm. guide tell you when they're going to break, when they're going to change gear, or when you need to go around a corner when you're running? Is it quite specific instructions? On the, the bike, um, there's way more talking on the run, for sure. On the bike, there is some. I think it depends on the team. I have a, a training guide here in Victoria, and she talks a lot on the bike, and I love it. Like She tells me when she's changing gears. She tells me when we're going into a corner, um, yeah. she yells out coast. Um, and so that is super helpful because there's, there's not wasted energy. And then you're also able to shift your body weight the way you need to. And, um, 
there's been times where she's like, she'll say a uh, left hand turn. So I'll, you know, put my knee out and, and drop down or whatever. And, and she's like, I didn't even have to steer. She's like, just your body weight made the bike go. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then on the run, there's definitely more instruction just because there's on the bike, you're kind of one unit. Whereas on the run, you're back to being two. And so it's easier for me to trip over things or, um, I, and world championships, I fell off the curb and landed on my butt, you know, it's because it was just so narrow. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's, there's a way more talking needed um, on, for me anyway, on the run. Yeah, of course. Well, yeah, I just think it's absolutely amazing. Um, again, it comes back to what you said before about having trust. And I guess, like you said, you're one unit, you're, you're committed. So no, I think that's awesome. And I was doing a little bit of um, other reading. And obviously, <laughs> challenge of training during lockdown um you've I read a blog that you put out that was you know you're at home you're on your own and I was quite impressed that you learned how to change a tire am I right <laughs> yeah I did I was really I'm not sure that I could actually do that so I don't know if I could do it again but I was like I need to do my ride and so <laughs> that's amazing yeah no, I was I can clean impressive. a bike. I'm good at cleaning a bike. I yeah, I'm sure in a pinch I would be able to change the tire again. <laughs> but, yeah, I think you can get there. And I also read that you've had a little bit more time and you've done a bit of baking. Yeah, so um, I used to hate cooking. Okay. I found it incredibly stressful. Um, just because I think I probably have that athlete mentality where it's like if it didn't come out the way it was supposed to, then I'm like. I didn't do this right. And I, you know, you like, you know, when you go into a workout and you're like, I didn't hit those times, what's wrong with me? <laughs> you know? that. And so, um, so I had to have a bit of a attitude change and, um, and be willing to make mistakes. And I made a rule that if it turns out really bad, then I'm allowed to order pizza. And, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. and so I actually really enjoy cooking now. Um, Baking, still not as much. It's more fun. And if it doesn't turn out, oh, well. But um, I, I, I would prefer cooking, I think. <laughs> Has there been anything else that you've sort of taken up during lockdown that you probably wouldn't have done otherwise? Um, no, I don't think so. I think, I think, I mean, out of necessity, learning how to, how to cook good food with really good quality ingredients was, was kind of something I tasked myself with. Um, and so that was, that was, I'm still learning and, it, and it's enjoyable and, um, and obviously it has a benefit, you know, for training. Um, I'm, I'm lucky in that where I live, there's a lot of outdoor spaces that I can get to. And so I think in lockdown, I've been really lucky in that, you know, we're still allowed out <clears throat> in those, in those green spaces. And so um, I've spent a lot of time outside, which just makes me very, very happy. Like playing in the dirt with the dogs is kind of my happy place. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the same. We, um, got a black lab and he just oh. loves me outside. So we just go walking um, and he's always happy. So it's yeah, I know. So good. <laughs> and <laughs> Obviously, you've had a very successful career. Can you tell us what some of those highlights might have been in your career and some of the periods that have been the most difficult for you? Um, yeah, I, Pan Am Games uh, comes back to me as kind of a highlight. Um, yes, I won a bunch of medals, but it, it was more than that. I had been fighting injury um, the year before that. And so I actually didn't go to world championships because of the injury. Um, the coach chose, or I don't know. Anyway, I was taken off the team, um, because of the injury, how long it lingered. Um, and so I really was fighting my way back and, you know, I was a university student at the time and swimming isn't cheap. And so, um, <laughs> you know, so it was all these compounding factors. So when I, when I made it to, to the Pan Am Games and I 
for me, that was, that was a huge highlight. And then to be able to be so successful was just so nice. And part of me wishes I had retired after that because <laughs> um, it would have been a really good way to end a career, but <clears throat> um, I carried on to, into Beijing and um, that year was a struggle for me. There was an event change. They took out the breaststroke and I was a breaststroker. Um, and then suddenly I had to go back to freestyle and um, I was finishing off university. So I was stressed out and um, I had a bunch of coach changes. Like there was just, Oh, sorry. One of my dogs is contributing to the conversation. Um, <laughs> there was, um, you know, there was just a lot that went on and we got, we got to the staging in Japan and I was like, I don't feel right. And they're like, well, you're tapering. You're not supposed to feel right. I'm like, no, I've tapered before. This doesn't feel right. No. Um, and we got to the games and things just sort of went sideways. So, um, you know, but, and, and I, I've, I mean, I've said in other interviews before that, like I left the sport very angry um, and that's not a good way to leave a sport. So I think that might've been, well, it was, it was part of my motivation to come back and try again is that um, I, I don't want to leave angry. <laughs> yeah, and I think that the world of uh, para triathlon has been um, graciously accepting of you and you've been absolutely amazing. Um, I've seen that <laughs> kind of over your world championships that you've done Rotterdam, I think you came sixth and then yeah. <laughs> I want to, then you've come fourth in Gold Coast, third in Lausanne. So I think then you also won the Tokyo event. So, I mean, I don't really 20? know how that happens. <laughs> but it, you must be excited for this year. And um, do you have any plans for the world championships or I guess Tokyo 2021? Um, I mean, like where I'm, you know, like everybody else, I'm training as though everything's going to go on and um, I'm yeah. excited to race. I haven't raced at all since world championships and, in uh, Switzerland. So, um, you know, it'll, I'm just excited to race. Like, and I, I don't know what'll happen. You know, a lot can happen in a year and a half or however long it's been by the time we actually get to race. So, um, I, I don't, I don't know that I have plans because every time I make a plan, it changes. <laughs> so my plan is to race. <laughs> well, I think that, um, you're going to be pretty awesome. And I definitely, definitely think that you're one of the hopefuls to to look out for so yeah well <laughs> well done you and thank you for coming on here and um, chatting to me it's been amazing is there anything else that you'd like to chat about no I don't think so you I uh, thank you your your interviewing skills are great <laughs> oh, thank you very much <laughs> I've, I've been coming on each week like I've got a I don't know interview different people and your surname certainly tripped me up this week but it's um, yeah, that's okay it's fine. don't worry <laughs> thank you this was awesome and thanks for um you know putting us out there and and uh you know paratriathlon is such a cool sport I actually think if people understood it they would want to watch it um my my yeah. um my grandma's 90 and she's originally from Portugal and so her English isn't fantastic and um my mom went over and put the Tokyo test event on the television for my grandma to, to be able to see and like she was just so enthralled and amazed at like watching everyone you know doing yeah. what they were doing and and you know so like I I I think it it would catch on if people actually knew what was going on and it's pretty exciting I think so. I just think that sometimes when you see some of the disabilities and what people overcome to be able to do the sport, it inspires me as a Paralympian myself. Like I, yeah. you know, I, I train with a disability daily, but to watch other people, some some people just going the speeds. I mean, even just the speeds that you get on the tandem, and some people or the hand the cycles. Trapeze. People in the hand cycles just blow me away. I know some of the watts that they put out with their arms. Like I'm like, I've yeah. got two legs can't do that so yeah, <laughs> <I know. it's> <laughs> pretty amazing <laughs>